the development and careers of some of the foremost airplanes in American aviation history. And the greatness they achieved with the men who flew them makes quite a story. The aviation leadership of the United States today is the result of over 50 years of foresight and conviction in the hearts and minds of men. The flyers, the designers, the builders. This is a review of the products of a team that has built more airplanes than any other company in the world. Today, aviation is one of the largest employers of people in American industry. Today, there are more than 60,000 men and women on the North American team working at over 25 locations in Southern California, in Fresno, and in Columbus, Ohio. As with most companies, our beginnings were humble. In 1934, airplane manufacture was small business. Planes were built one at a time on a handmade basis by small teams of men. North American's airplane sales for the entire year of 1934 would keep today's operations going nicely for a little less than an hour. In those days, a contract for 10 or 15 planes was good. An order for 25 was phenomenal. Today, they're ordered by the hundreds. It was in 1935 that the company won its first military contract. It was for 82 BT-9 basic trainers, which began a long and proud history of leadership in the design and production of training airplanes. In the same period, the company's O-47 observation plane took military aviation well out of the biplane stage with one of the earliest all-metal planes produced in this country. This was the first observation plane completely designed around the needs of the observer. With these early airplanes, the starting team at North American pioneered for the industry the policy of designing airplanes for efficient manufacture and maintenance. In February 1937, with the XB-21 Dragon Bomber, the company completed its first venture into the twin engine class. This airplane was used for research and pioneered many advanced features, such as power-operated turrets and superchargers. It helped us gain important information for the development of later multi-engine bombers like the NA-40. Though practically forgotten today, the success of the NA-40 in 1939 inspired a great series of World War II airplanes. Beginning in 19, much of the company's production was concentrated on early versions of the Texan trainer, the AT-6, which was to become the best known and most universally used airplane in history. With the T-6, North American further refined its technique of designing and engineering an airplane for large-scale production. Hundreds were delivered to Britain, France, and other countries, which were preparing their defenses against the growing threats of the Axis powers. The T-6s were used to train the pilots, who were ultimately victorious in the Battle of Britain and nearly every other air battle in World War II. The Texan introduced the flying cadet to a low wing, retractable landing gear, controllable pitch propeller, and the general handling characteristics of combat planes. In addition to training pilots, they were used to train aerial gunners, tow target sleeves, and for dive bombing practice. The T-6 was the first plane selected by both the Air Force and Navy. As a United States Navy trainer, it was used to prepare pilots for carrier duty. In World War II, nearly every pilot in the American Air Services logged time in the AT-6. The flying cadets of 33 Allied nations received advanced flight training in this airplane. Versions of the Texan have been flown by more pilots than any other airplane in history. 
American military aviation began to come into its own on May 16, 1940, when the President of the United States asked for 50,000 planes to be in service as soon as possible and asked the aviation industry to prepare for production of 50,000 planes a year. At that time, the United States had a total of about 4,700 military planes, including trainers. And the industry was producing new planes at the rate of only about 500 a month. One of the most significant achievements of this era was the B-25 medium bomber, the Mitchell. By pioneering the mass production of aircraft before World War II, the men and women of North America were able to deliver as many as 396 Mitchells a month when the pressure was on. During World War II, a total of 9,816 B-25s were delivered. Perhaps the most significant event involving the B-25 occurred on April 18, 1942. The world was told this was Shangri-La. A lieutenant colonel by the name of Jimmy Doolittle led 16 Mitchells off the pitching deck of the aircraft carrier Hornet. On that morning, the Japanese Imperial Air Force and fleet units were far away, strangling the islands of the Dutch and Australians throughout the South Pacific. This daring strike brought war to Japan for the first time in 2,600 years. While the fires of the Doolittle Raid still burned, Nippon's fleet and air forces were heading back to protect home waters. From that day on, their dream of victory in the Pacific began to fade. The B-25 went into combat with the Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps. It was the most versatile air Europe, China, Burma, India, the Pacific. The B-25 ultimately carried 18 guns, which made it the most heavily armed airplane in the world. A 75 millimeter cannon, was added to two series of B-25s, never mounted in an airplane. In 1943, the Mitchells achieved a surprise success with low-level attacks. From then to the end of the war, the Mitchells continued to vary their operation from medium-altitude bombing to fighter-like ground attacks that often required the pilots to pull up to avoid flying into fences, trees, and houses. After the war, this workhorse continued in service as an advanced trainer. The durability and versatility of the B-25 eliminated the need for developing an entirely new multi-engine training airplane. This airplane was named for the late General Billy Mitchell, whose prophecy of the importance of air power is now legend. And the bombers named in his honor have strongly contributed to the air supremacy so vital today. In 1940, after months of pounding by the Nazi Luftwaffe in the Battle of Britain, the Royal Air Force was in a tight spot. They needed a fighter that could outfight anything in the sky, and they needed it fast. The British placed the order with North American, whose leaders believed they could create an entirely new fighter and have it in production in time. Around the clock, design, engineering, tooling, and production overlapped. 127 days later, in October 1940, the prototype of the P-51, the Mustang, rolled out of the hangar. In November 1941, one year after the initial test flight, the first production models were in service with the Royal Air Force. 
After Pearl Harbor, the United States Army Air Corps began making history of its own with the Mustang. 1943, North Africa. Nazi Field Marshal Rommel's Africa Corps had a surprise introduction to a new version of the Mustang. Fitted with dive brakes and bomb racks on its wings, this became known as the A-36 Invader, sometimes called the Screaming Demon. With the speed of a fighter and the firepower of a light bomber, the A-36 could blast the enemy with a bomb load up to 2,000 pounds. fight its way home against any fighter the Luftwaffe could muster. In 1943, the United States began a program of daylight bombing raids from bases in England to targets in Germany. The most dangerous parts of the missions were made without escort fighters. No fighter has sufficient range to fly the distance. Day after day, many of our bombers were shot down by German interceptor planes. General Hap Arnold, chief of the Army Air Corps in the Second World War, called for a long-range fighter to escort our bombers over Europe. Doubling the range of the P-51 made it the first fighter capable of escorting our bombers from England to fight over the farthest targets in Germany and make it all the way back home. Because of the Mustang, we were able to continue and increase our daylight bombing deeper into Europe. When he saw the P-51s over Berlin, Hermann Goering is said to have admitted the war was lost. And he was right, it was. At their peak, our North American production lines were turning out one Mustang every hour, 24 hours a day, for an unprecedented total of 15,485. The P-51s were continuously modified and improved to benefit from lessons learned by the Air Forces in combat and to fulfill the basic need of all weapons to be superior to anything in the enemy's arsenal. Later versions were redesigned to give pilots for the first time on any airplane the advantage of 360 degree visibility with a bubble canopy. The Mustang could operate to 40,000 feet for photo reconnaissance, bomber escort, and for attacks on enemy bombers and escort fighters. Many Mustang sorties were right down on the deck where their propellers barely cleared the ground. the end of the war in Europe, the P-51, through the courtesy of Hitler's Luftwaffe, had the distinction of working over the first jet airplanes in the world. Even today, many people are not aware that the Germans built jets and managed to get a few into combat. In 1944, a committee of the United States Senate evaluated the P-51 as the most aerodynamically perfect pursuit plane in existence. Last of the series was the F-82, the twin Mustang, a long-range day and night fighter escort and reconnaissance plane, which set a non-stop record of 4,968 miles from Honolulu to New York in 14 hours, 31 minutes. 
Even in the jet age, following World War II, the Mustang remained a first-line fighter. Some were stationed overseas with forward area defensive groups. Others were assigned to National Guard outfits and to Air Force bases to groom new fighter pilots. Some of them went into civilian life to make a common practice of breaking speed and distance records for single-engine aircraft. In action over Korea, the Mustangs were again a powerful and effective weapon. Thousands of our bomber crews and ground forces, the P-51 had been the most wanted and the most beautiful sight in the world. Near the end of the Korean War, this great veteran was retired from combat. The top fighter in the world in its lifetime inevitably gave way to the jet. The reality of the jet engine launched the most dynamic engineering effort in aviation history. For the United States Navy, the FJ-1, the first of North American's Fury jets, went into active service in February 1948, and the jet age of aviation was underway. One month later, in March of 1948, off the coast of Southern California, Furies, piloted by Navy commanders Pete Oran and Bob Elder, were the first American operational jet aircraft to carry out landings and takeoffs aboard a carrier at sea. The FJ-1 was the first American jet fighter to employ a single straight ram duct with its opening in the nose. With the air intake, engine and fuel tanks enclosed within the fuselage, the FJ-1 was given super thin, high speed wings. After making the Navy's first operational jet landings and takeoffs at sea, Navy pilots went on to establish three West Coast inner-city speed records with the FJ-1. On the 1135-mile course from Seattle to San Diego, flying time was two hours and 12 minutes. Jet fighters made jet bombers an inevitable requirement. Air Force B-45, the Tornado Bomber, was the first four-jet airplane to fly in the United States. Comparable in size to some of the heavy bombers of World War II, the B-45 is rated as a light bomber by present-day standards. At the Atomic Proving Ground in Nevada, the Tornado became the first jet airplane to drop an atomic bomb. Another version of the Tornado series is the high-altitude photo reconnaissance bomber, the RB-45C. Many of these airplanes were modified for in-flight refueling and helped pioneer the technique for jet aircraft. The RB-45C has seen duty in key areas throughout the world, including Korea. The first seagoing heavy bomber in carrier operation with the United States Navy was the Savage, the AJ-1. The first airplane designed specifically to carry the atomic bomb. The Savage was developed for carrier-based missions requiring long range, high speed, and altitude. The Savage has a single jet engine installed in the fuselage to boost its speed for bombing runs and other combat requirements. Planes in the AJ series can be folded for easier handling on deck edge elevators and stowage below on the hangar deck. Still other versions were developed. The AJ-2 was second of the original bomber series. A carrier-based tanker was produced for in-flight refueling of other planes. The AJ-2 
AJ-2P was designed for carrier-based photo reconnaissance. The Savage series is a group of attack weapons that can operate from a carrier task force at a longer range and with a heavier payload than any other propeller-driven carrier aircraft. Post-war successor to the T-6 Texan trainer series was the T-28. Much faster and completely new in every respect, it was one of the first trainers to have a tricycle landing gear, which helps eliminate ground loops and makes it a particularly safe airplane for beginner pilots. The versatility and fighter-like handling characteristics of the T-28 made it readily adaptable to any portion of a flight training program. Like the Texan, the T-28 is on duty with both the Air Force and Navy. MIG Alley, Korea, December 1950. Colonel Bruce Hinton launched the Air Force conquest of the Russian-built MiG-15s. This was the baptism of fire for the F-86, the Sabrejet. Today, of course, we take swept wing aircraft pretty much for granted. But back in 1945, it was a radical and revolutionary idea. The speed of sound was the goal, even then. Wing design was one of the biggest problems. At that time, North American was developing a new high-speed straight-wing fighter. Late in the design program, the new fighter was completely redesigned with 35 degrees of sweep on the wings and tail. The idea proved itself early in wind tunnel tests. From the first test flight in October of 1947, the aviation world knew that the Sabre jet was destined to become one of the nation's first line fighters. In September 1948, flying a standard production model with a full combat load, Major Richard Johnson shattered the world's speed record with what was then an incredible speed, 670 miles per hour. Impressive as speed records are, however, there is more to winning a battle than speed alone. Much more. The safe Korean War record proved this against heavier odds than any other fighter has ever faced. The F-86 Sabre proved to be a rugged workhorse that could take a lot of combat punishment, as well as dish it out. Features of the basic combat season Sabre design were continuously improved and adapted to an ever-widening range of combat requirements. Later models to stab through Korean skies were even more deadly, capable of attacking faster, higher, with increased firepower and accuracy. There is no better testimony to the Sabre jet's combat effectiveness than the amazing record set by our pilots, who racked up 802 MiG kills with only 58 Sabre losses, a ratio of almost 14 to 1 for the Korean War. Consistent victories were a tribute to the skill of our pilots, to the wide range of capabilities engineered into the airplanes, and to the men and women who built them in ever-increasing numbers. 
Lessons learned with the saber jet in combat will have a big influence on both design and tactics for many years to come. To protect our own country in these times of jet bombers, North American produced an entirely new saber jet, the F-86D, all-weather interceptor, the Continental Defender. In August of 1953, Air Force Colonel Bill Barnes set a new international speed record with the D, 715 miles an hour. F-86D was the first one-man jet interceptor in the world, the first to be armed exclusively with rockets. The D-Sabre jet was the operational preview of the electronic pilot age. Part of its electromechanical brain involves the latest radar and electronic computing systems for locating, ranging, and tracking other planes in any condition of weather or combat, then automatically firing its rockets with conclusive accuracy. For the Navy and Marine Corps, the first swept-wing carrier operational fighter to join the fleet was the new Fury jet, the FJ-2. Methods of operating jet aircraft from carrier flight decks were pretty well established with planes like the FJ-1. The transition to the swept-wing Fury jet was simplified because of its outstanding stability and control in any operating situation. The design for the new Fury jets had the benefit of all the engineering and combat experience gained with the F-86 and fulfilled the Navy's requirement for the speed advantage of a swept wing fighter. Its excellent control and flight characteristics make an unusually stable gun platform for its four 20 millimeter cannon. With more powerful engines and other improvements, Later versions of the Fury jet continue to rank among the most capable fighters in the history of Naval and Marine Corps aviation. The mission assigned to the Fury is to achieve and maintain air superiority in the vicinity of the task force, the beachhead, or other assigned battle areas. To the men and women of the aviation industry, crossing new frontiers is a familiar experience. Supersonic flight with production aircraft began with the F-100, the Super Sabre. This airplane was as great an advance over the F-86 as the 86 was over the P-51. The F-100 has a 45 degree sweep to its razor thin wings and tail. All the thrust of an afterburner coupled to the most powerful jet engine in production, the F-100 still had a speed potential beyond the capability of its power plant. The Super Sabre was more than a new design. It was an engineering achievement of the highest order. It required a completely new approach to nearly every phase of design and brought about many new manufacturing methods as well. On its very first test flight, the Super Sabre went faster than sound. Four months later, Colonel Pete Everest flew the F-100 to a new international speed record of 755.149 miles per hour. The F-100 was the world's first operational fighter capable of exceeding the speed of sound in climbing or level flight and continuing in the supersonic speed range as long as necessary. By a considerable margin, the Super Sabre outperformed any previous fighter and was capable of outfighting any known combat aircraft of its time.
and it was versatile. Various models were adapted for fighter-bomber missions with bombs, rockets, napalm, and even atomic weapons. Air superiority is the business of North Americans' airplanes. During World War II, aviation research was limited. The priority for all effort was production. Engineering work was concentrated on refinements and modifications of the airplanes already in production. After the war, top men in many new fields of science and technology joined the North American team. 30% of the company's personnel went to work on research and development projects for the future. In 1946, an atomic energy program was established to explore the possibilities of nuclear power as a means of propulsion for missiles and aircraft. Early research indicated that atomic energy reactors were not immediately practical for aircraft propulsion, but offered many other opportunities. So North American's atomic energy research turned to new long-range studies in reactor materials and technology. This model shows the design for a pilot plant to produce central station electrical power for communities and industry. A tremendous amount of heat is produced by the fission process in the core of the reactor. In this chamber, liquid metal is heated, then circulated through a heat exchanger to produce steam, which drives a conventional electric generator. Another important contribution to science was a medical research reactor. It can be used in the study and treatment of diseases like cancer. With this reactor, scientists can develop additional uses of atomic energy in many technical and industrial fields, as well as further medical research. In these and still other ways, the post-war research at North American has advanced the peacetime applications of atomic energy, bringing increasing benefits of this new technology to mankind. Following World War II, the research and development in most fields had to begin at the outer limit of men's knowledge and cross new horizons in supersonic aerodynamics, thermodynamics, airframe design, and flight control. To help get the answers, millions of dollars were invested in the development and construction of elaborate test equipment, like one of the first supersonic wind tunnels in the country, which can test new designs for airplanes and missiles at speeds up to 4,000 miles per hour. The speed of a large guided missile must be so great that enemy interception is highly improbable, even by counter missiles. So, in addition to new design concepts, stronger materials and new manufacturing methods had to be devised. Missiles have brought about a new world of aviation an expanding world of science with new continents of technology. Our national security requires that many of the features of guided missiles remain secret. This much can be said. First of all, the guidance system is composed of sub-miniature navigation and flight control equipment, which must be able to accurately and automatically fly the missile over a long range to pinpoint a specific target. Accuracy is the measure of success. Many components are machined and assembled under high-powered microscopes to precision tolerances beyond imagination in World War II. The system must be small and lightweight and able to function with unprecedented speed under the most difficult conditions. It must be immune to enemy countermeasures such as jamming. The guidance system is actually a brain. It has a phenomenal memory. It can solve problems and follow through with correct behavior. It must make in-flight corrections for things like wind current, storms, rotation of the earth, and still pinpoint a target. North Americans work in the field of electronics, including automatic navigation, fire and flight control equipment, for aircraft with and without pilots. 
represents the most advanced progress in this field today. Rocket engines and fuels have taken us into still another sphere of technology. The achievements of the men and women working in this program have made North American the leading builder of large rocket engines. For short periods, some of these rocket engines are capable of delivering horsepower substantially greater than the total power output of Hoover Dam. These are some of the programs, accomplishments, and goals of an organization of people that has devoted more than a quarter of a century to American aviation leadership. The challenge of the future looks more exciting than ever. <laughs>